Hello, I'm Rob Witcher, and today we're going to talk about stored cross-site scripting. There's actually three major types of cross-site scripting. There's stored, reflected, and DOM, document object model. And in this video, we're going to talk about stored. Now, before I get into the technical details of exactly how this works, or at least a high-level overview of it, let's sort of frame how this is going to work by going through a quick story. So let's start with a website that you've probably heard of that allows you to post pictures, and underneath those pictures, you can post some comments. So let's think of a website that we all know of, like, say, Facebook.com. So imagine I log into Facebook.com and I find that a buddy of mine has posted a beautiful photo of him and his daughter. And being the very good friend that I am, I decide to post a comment under that photo. I write something like, oh, what a beautiful photo. It's too bad she looks just like you. So that's the comment that I post. Now, what happens with that comment? Well, when I hit submit and my pithy comment gets sent to the web server, the web server stores that comment in a database or something like that somewhere. And then every subsequent user that visits that particular page looks at that particular photo. What is their browser going to also download and display? My comment. So that's the scenario, okay? We're looking for a website that allows us to post comments and then those comments are downloaded by our users. Now, this is one way of doing stored cross-site scripting. So let's look through how it would work, okay? Now, we're going to start with our baddie here. And you can tell he's our baddie because he's wearing a fedora. So our baddie here needs to discover a vulnerable website. And to be clear, I used Facebook.com as an example, but I don't think they're actually susceptible to this form of cross-site scripting currently. They've got excellent security. Now, <laughs> Our baddie here discovers a vulnerable website. And I'll explain what a vulnerable website means in a couple of minutes here. But our baddie here discovers a vulnerable website. And so here's our website. It's this www web server up here, okay? Now, the first thing that our baddie does here is our baddie injects some malicious code into the web page. Now, that sounds very technical, but it can actually be a very simple thing. Our baddie could find a website that allowed the user to type in some information, some text in a comment field and hit submit. And when the baddie here hits submit on that comments field, what's actually happening is some data is being sent from our baddie to the web server. That data is essentially being injected into the server. So it sounds complicated, but in this particular instance that we're talking about, it's actually very simple. Now, what's gonna happen next? The server has stored this information. And now every subsequent user, in this case a victim because something bad is going to happen to them, every subsequent user that visits this particular page on this particular web server, what's going to happen? Well, the server is going to look up the comments that have been provided underneath whatever photo or something that's been, that's been posted. And the web server is going to send that data to our victim. And included in that web page is going to be not only the comments from all the other users, it's going to be the comment from our baddie here. And what was that comment? Well, that comment was JavaScript code. So what is our victim's browser going to do with that JavaScript code? It's going to do exactly what it's designed to do, which is it's going to execute the code. So when our victim's browser here gets a web page from this server and contained within that web page is this comment, this containing this JavaScript code, our user's browser here is going to execute that JavaScript code. And what's going to happen when our user's browser executes that JavaScript code? Well, typically what's going to happen is some data is going to be sent from our user here, from our victim to our baddie. And What's often sent here is some cookies or other information like that, but fundamentally, the bad thing that's happening here is our victim's browser is being forced or coerced into sending some data to our baddie here. Why do we call this stored cross-site scripting? Well, because 
Once the body has sent this code to injected this code into the web server, that code is stored on the server. And this also is sometimes referred to as a persistent cross-site scripting attack because once that code is stored on the server, now every single victim that comes and visits that particular web page on the server, they're going to be sent that malicious code and the victim is going to execute that code and something bad is going to happen to them. And so this attack remains persistent. It keeps happening to every subsequent user until that malicious code is somehow removed from the web server. So that's why it's referred to as stored slash persistent cross-site scripting. Now the final thing that's interesting to think about here is exactly who is the target of attack here? Who does our baddie ultimately wish to inflict this attack upon? Who is the target of the attack? Is it the web server or is it our victim here, our user? And the answer of course is that the target of attack is the victim. It's ultimately the victim here that the, the baddie wants to get some data from. The target of attack is our user, or more specifically, our user's browser. So that's stored or persistent process scripting.